When shopping for yarn, you have lots of choices to make from the color to the fiber content, but also the washability of the yarn. And so for today's video, I'm unpacking the information that you might need to know as a yarn consumer regarding superwash treated yarns. So get comfortable and let's dive in. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Wool Needles Hands Midweek Ramble. My name is Taylor and I will be your host. I'm really excited for today's video because this is a topic of discussion in the fiber community all the time. And it's also the topic of queries I receive in my inbox over at Fiber for the People. I am also the owner and hand dyer of all Fiber for the People yarn and superwash treated yarn and the process behind that is definitely something that I consider when purchasing yarn bases for my shop. Now, not only is this a really popular topic of discussion in the fiber community in general, it is also a very popular suggestion that I receive in my inbox at woolneedleshands.com slash tip line for future video episodes. As you know, the topics for the majority of the midweek rambles I produce here on the channel are submitted by viewers over at the Wool Needles Hands tip line. So if you have an idea for a future video, you can go ahead and submit it at woolneedleshands.com backslash tip line. The show notes for this video can be found down in the description box below the video. You can also find a link and some additional information in the pinned comment below this video that will link you off to the show notes over on woolneedleshands.com. And if you scan the QR code on your screen, you'll have quick access to the show notes there as well if you happen to be watching this on a smart TV. Also, I wanna mention that all of my notes for today's video were taken in the all new Knit Fabet collection notebook that is available now in the Wool Needles Hands merch shop over at woolneedleshands.com. I have shifted my merchandise supplier to a new supplier that I've used in the past for Fiber for the People that I trust, that I love. They have a great variety of products and I am now hosting all of those merch sales at woolneedleshands.com directly as opposed to the previous supplier at Teespring. You can still purchase merch from the spring supplier. However, I'm not going to be including new merch on that website. I'm going to be hosting all of the merch sales over at woolneedleshands.com shop merch. So if you'd like to support the channel, definitely check out the merch shop. See if there's something there that strikes your fancy. Lots of fun conversation starters. And I so appreciate the additional support. Okay, enough of that. Let's go ahead and dive in. The intention of this video is to provide you with information that you can use to inform your choices when you're shopping for yarn. And in terms of washability, those two choices are super wash, or non superwash. In no way do I want you to leave this video feeling that superwash yarn and non superwash yarn have been pitted against one another. This is not a superwash versus non superwash video. I believe that these two equally hold a place in the fiber community and carry very valuable attributes. Let's begin by talking a little bit about why the superwash treatment exists in the first place. And in order to understand that, you need to understand a little bit about wool fiber in general. Now, at some point or another, in your life, you may have seen shampoo and conditioner commercials that show you what a strand of hair looks like under a microscope. They tend to show you a really lovely, smooth strand of hair when the person is using XYZ shampoo and conditioner. And then if you have really dry and frazzled hair, or if you're using a competitor's shampoo and conditioner, they show a strand of hair that has all of these weird, jagged, scaly things coming off of it. My hair doesn't need a stylist. It needs a therapist. And that's just what I I got with Pantene Pro-V Treatment Conditioner to calm damaged cuticles, adding shine and control. When I think of wool fiber, when I think of the cuticle on wool fiber, I think of those commercials. It's just the easiest thing to help me visualize what wool fiber looks like under a microscope. All natural wool fiber has what's called a cuticle. This is an outer casing of what maybe you could consider dead skin cells that coat the shaft of the fiber. And what happens is, is as these dead cells are produced, they layer one over the other, creating what is essentially scales on the outside of the fiber core. These scales on the outside of wool kind of overlapping are what give wool its resiliency, its memory, its warmth, Warmth. These are scales layered one over the other. There's air that gets trapped in between them and that's what provides that warmth. Also, because we have these scales there, they tend to have a little bit of a grippiness to them. If you draw your hand down the 
the shaft of the fiber going the way the grain goes on the cuticle, it's going to feel relatively smooth. But if you go the opposite direction along the core in the cuticle, you're going to pick up all of those little dry scale layers and it's going to feel tacky and grippy. That grippiness, that tack, is what allows wool to kind of cling to itself. It gives it that resiliency, it makes it beautiful for color work knitting, it allows it to retain its shape because it has something to grip onto. Now sometimes that grippiness can go just a little too far and the different locks of fiber can get stuck together irrevocably, you can't pull them apart, and that's when we have felt. Now this typically happens under certain circumstances. There needs to be agitation, there needs to be heat, sometimes you only need one of those things, and if you add water it's a trifecta of absolute felting perfection. Now sometimes that's a desirable outcome, a lot of times it can be an absolute nightmare. So for the characteristics that make wool what it is in terms of resiliency and memory and how beautiful it can be in color work projects, that can also turn around and bite you in the butt if it's not considered when it comes time to wash your knits. I'll just get this washed for you. <laughs> That's what the wool fiber has for us. That's what we're working with. And that must have been what begged the question, how can we take this amazing fiber, retain some of those real high quality characteristics while also allowing it to be washable without being felted? Enter the superwash treatment process. Now this is a process that goes back to the early 20th century. I think it kind of hit its stride in the 70s, but it was being worked on and experimented with from the 20s all the way up into the 50s and then like I said in the 70s it kind of took off from there and became much more commercial and industrial. But the whole purpose of this process was to allow for the amazing wool fiber to be much more easily cared for. And a big reason that there was such a need for this was because wool was one of the primary fibers used in textiles in the military. They needed to eliminate that risk of unnecessary shrinkage and ultimately a loss of materials. And then the commercial clothing industry started using this process with the yarns that they were using to create the clothing for mass markets. All in the name of washability and easy care. And if it worked for those industries it was sure to appeal to hand knitters as well who wanted to be able to produce garments that were easy to care for for a variety of different reasons. Today there are several reasons that consumers are choosing superwash treated yarn. Of course it's washability but also it's tech Texture. Some folks tend to like the smooth texture of superwash treated yarn, and we'll talk a little bit about why it has a smoother texture than a non-superwash counterpart, but that is one of the reasons why some folks choose superwash over non-superwash yarn. The texture, the softness, the grist of the yarn, which is essentially the yarn's density, is a little bit lighter with superwash treated yarn, and some of these things are right down some folks' alley. Other folks love to choose superwash treated yarn, especially when it comes from independent hand dyers because it displays dye jobs beautifully. The color you can get with superwash treated yarn in terms of hand dyeing is absolutely vibrant. Some of the most beautiful hand dyed yarns with crisp variegation and really sharp speckles happen on superwash treated yarn. Now that doesn't mean that you can't get beautiful hand dyed colorways on non superwash treated yarn, it just means that you need to do a little more to that yarn in terms of preparing it for hand dyeing in order to achieve those results. Superwash treated yarn is just perfect for achieving those results without a lot of other processing steps in the dyeing process to achieve vibrant bright colors. And then availability is another reason why some folks might choose superwash. You can find superwash treated yarn in the independent yarn market very easily. It is most prevalent between superwash and non-superwash in this industry because when it comes to suppliers supplying dyers with yarn it is most prevalent in those suppliers stock. Now to contrast that some of the reasons why folks may not choose superwash treated yarn and might prefer something non-superwash or untreated is because they're looking for something all natural. They're looking for the natural texture of the wool fiber. They want to feel that cuticle on the fiber which will come across in the form of that rustic hand or they have other ideological reasons for choosing something all natural natural. Or they might actually be looking for something that is going to felt. I see a little silhouette of a man. If you are a felter or you like to knit for the purpose of felting, you're definitely not going to want to choose a superwash treated yarn because it's only going to work against you. So you're going to be more inclined to choose something that is untreated, natural, and able to felt. Now in order to dive a 
little bit deeper into this and address the elephant in the room that is coming up later, we have to talk a little bit about the process for superwashing. What is it that they're doing and how does it change the yarn? Now, this process has evolved quite a bit since it started in the early 20th century, but we're going to focus on what is primarily done today. And I'm going to draw from my own supplier and the information that I have gathered from my supplier at Fiber for the People in terms of how my yarn is superwash treated. I cannot guarantee that all hand dyers are providing you yarn that is superwash treated in this way, but I can be pretty certain that it is because the vast majority of superwash treatment processes are done the same way. Now I mentioned earlier in the episode, the cuticle of the wool fiber. That's that outer coating of the fiber core that's made up of dry flaky material. And it lays over the core of the fiber like scales. Those scales are what causes yarn to shrink and felt. Without those scales, fiber cores, when rubbing together, would just slip right on by without any grabbing on. You wouldn't have the felting process. And so for this reason, the superwash treatment process has to address the scales. The most common way that this is done for commercial yarns and even yarns that you can purchase from independent hand dyers is called the Hercocet method. The Hercocet process was developed by the textile company Hercules and Limited in the 20th century. This process follows a five-step method for making wool fiber felt resistant and shrink resistant. First, the wool is scoured, and this means that the wool is cleaned of any debris of any residual materials left in the fiber after the fiber was carded and milled. The fibers are then treated with a chlorinated polymer resin across the entire fiber core, sealing down the cuticle, dulling the tips of the scales, and making them resistant to that grippy nature that they have, allowing them to felt. Essentially, each individual fiber will slide right on by each of the other fibers, they won't grab on, and they won't felt and shrink. Once that's done, they have to cure that resin at a really high temperature so everything sets. This particular process is very acidic, and so the fourth step of the process is to neutralize the fiber. The fiber is dipped and rinsed in an alkaline solution to reduce any acidity and prepare it for conditioning. He calls it the dip. And then the final step, the fiber is rinsed, conditioned, and turned into yarn. Now it's important to note here that even though this does a really great job of sealing in that cuticle, keeping this resistant to felting, it can be washed in a machine, but you really need to avoid drying this at high temperatures because it is possible to reactivate that polymer in high heat, causing it to kind of meld into the fiber and creating something that you really don't want. I wouldn't necessarily say that it felts, it just turns into something that is completely unusable. So even though it is machine washable and dryable, it all needs to be done on cool temperatures. This is the process that most fiber undergoes when it is given the superwash treatment. It's the process used by my suppliers for fiber for the people. And I am willing to bet that any supplier that is supplying yarn to hand dyers in the United States or anywhere right now is providing yarn that comes from wool that has been superwash treated using the Hercocet process. There are other methods being explored for superwashing yarn and some that have been used in the past but are being used much less frequently because of their environmental footprint. That would be including exposing the fiber to chlorine gas, which is not only bad for the environment, it's also really bad for the people working in the facilities. Also exposing yarn to ozone. I'm not really sure what kind of footprint that carries, but I do know that's something that's being explored as well, as well as some additional treatment options that are being explored. But you can bet that if you're purchasing yarn that is superwash treated, it has undergone the hurt set process. So let's go ahead and address the elephant in the room. And I know that this is one that is called into question often when this comes up as a topic for discussion. And that is the environmental factor of the superwash treatment process. I'm going to explain what I know to you based on facts that I have researched myself and things that you can dig a little bit more through with the sources I've provided in the show notes. Now, there are two main factors that people consider when it comes to the environmental implications of the superwash treatment process. The first being the disposal 
disposal of the effluent from the process, which is essentially the disposal of the water that is residual once the process has been done. And then a second thing that people consider when it comes to the environmental implications is how fiber coated in a polymer results in microplastics in the ocean. So we're gonna talk a little bit about both of these, starting with the effluent that comes from the process of superwashing. Again, effluent just refers to the disposal water. He calls it the dip. Now, as I mentioned when I was telling you what the Hercocet process was, I mentioned that the polymer coating is a chlorinated polymer coating. That results in an effluent that contains a high percentage of chlorine. Most places or most industrialized countries that have any kind of chemical treatment plants are also regulated by very strict environmental laws, making it absolutely illegal and prohibited to dispose of any byproduct of a chemical treatment process into the waterways. And because of these strict standards, most of the superwash treatment facilities that are superwash treating the fibers in the yarns you're purchasing are ensuring that all of that wastewater byproduct is absolutely neutralized and is cleaner than the average drinking tap water. It is important to note, however, that there are some places in the world who do provide superwash treatments and the environmental standards are just not as high. If you're purchasing from an independent yarn dyer or a small yarn business or any yarn company in general, you should be able to inquire after this if you are concerned about how the superwash treatment is done and how they're handling their byproduct. But for the most part, you can take comfort in knowing that the vast majority of superwash treated yarn comes from facilities that are regulated by very high ecological and environmental standards. For example, Fiber for the People yarn sources yarn that uses fiber that has undergone the superwash treatment at facilities that hold ISO 14001 accreditation. It is essentially a guide that helps a facility shape an effective environmental management system, essentially keeping them above board with all of their environmental and ecological standards, making sure they're doing everything right to keep their environmental footprint as small as possible. Now, if we haven't already bitten off more than we can chew, let's go ahead and address that last elephant in the room in terms of environmental implications, and that is how superwash treated wool contributes to the microplastic pollutions in our oceans and in our world in general. Now I'm here to tell you that within the last three years, research has been done about the topic of whether or not superwash treated wool contributes to microplastics in the ocean as those textiles biodegrade, and no evidence to this day has been found to support this notion. In fact, both treated and untreated wool were found to biodegrade readily in the ocean, and machine washable wool actually biodegraded faster than untreated wool, both resulting in zero evidence of microplastics being left in the water. And that's good news. Now, before we wrap this all up and top it with a bow, I wanna mention one more key detail to keep in mind when considering superwash treated yarn. And essentially what that is, is how superwash treated yarn behaves in comparison to its non-superwash counterpart. The main thing that you need to understand here is that because superwash treated yarns are made with fibers that no longer have an active cuticle, that means that the cuticle and scales that coat the outside of the fiber core have been coated with polymer and are no longer going to grip one another when the fibers slide next to one another, because they don't have that grippiness, any fabric that is produced with these yarns is not going to have the memory and the resilience that a fabric would have if it were knit with a fiber that retains the cuticle and grippiness that is natural for wool fiber. Now, this doesn't mean that this is a bad thing. This just means that it's something you need to be aware of so you can plan your project accordingly. If you know you're going to be knitting a garment with superwash treated yarn, one thing that is absolutely essential is to number one, acknowledge the fact that whatever you knit, once you block it, it's going to grow but also to get comfortable with the fact that you're going to need to swatch. You need to knit a gauge swatch and you need to block your gauge swatch so that you can get an idea of just how much that garment is going to grow. I've been there, we've all had some kind of experience with an unwanted effect when using superwash yarn for the first time. I mean, I guess I can't say we all have, but it is a very common experience. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have unexpected growth once we block our piece. So no going into it, superwash treated yarn does not have that memory. It does not have that resilience and snapback because those cuticles are coated over with polymer. Do a swatch, wash your swatch, take note of how much growth you experienced and choose the size that you're going to knit 
or crochet or whatever it is that you're doing accordingly. Well, that was an absolute mouthful and a whirlwind. I hope you're still with me. That was a lot of information to take in. And I want you to know that if you would like to dive deeper into any of the things that I mentioned here, because I am, you know, kind of scraping the surface here, trying to package this in a way that's easily accessible and understandable for folks and also not too overwhelming. But if you do want to dive a little deeper, I have provided you with a lot of sources in the description box in the show notes. I've also provided you with a link to the case study that discusses the whole concept of microplastics in the ocean and how superwash treated yarns contribute or do not contribute based on their foundings to microplastic pollutions in the oceans. If you would like to know more about that, I will link that down below for you as well. So don't hesitate to dive a little deeper and learn a little bit more for yourself and just make yourself that much more of an informed yarn consumer. Both superwash and non-superwash yarns have their place. They are valuable to many people for many different reasons. And for some folks, it's what makes knitting a lot more accessible to them. Washability is a big deal. And fortunately, we can be fairly certain that wherever we're procuring our superwash treated yarn, that yarn was produced by fibers that were treated to the highest ecological standards available. So if you're choosing to knit with superwash treated yarn because you love that vibrant dye job, or if you're choosing to knit with it because you need that ease of washability, or if you're choosing to forego superwash treated yarn because you prefer something all natural. You want to feel the wool fiber and you want to know that there's nothing getting between your fingers and that beautiful wool fiber. That is all great. You have the choice. Those options are available to you and both are viable and valuable options. Go forth and knit with confidence and feel good about the choice you're making because now you have a little bit more information to fuel those decisions. You can be an educated consumer. And the fact that you're taking the time to learn more about the materials that you're using says a lot about you as a crafter and that's a big deal as well. So thank you for taking the time to sit here with me today and listen to me ramble about this topic. It's been a fun video. It's been a lot to think about. It's been a lot of research and I absolutely enjoyed the opportunity to share it with you. If you took value from this episode in any way or learned something new, please don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. Definitely subscribe and click that bell icon so you can be notified anytime I upload new content, which is every Wednesday and every Sunday. And just so you know, it's not always this rich with information. It's usually a lot more laid back, but this was a good one and very important. Until I see you guys again for Sunday's episode of the podcast, happy knitting, happy making, happy whatever it is that you're doing. Take care, be well, and I will see you soon. Bye.